kind of like it up here. <laughs> Are we ready? Are we ready? Hello. Attention, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. I want to welcome you all to June's AOI luncheon and to the National, Women's National Democratic Club. My name is Rick Marino, and I'm the secretary of AOI, and I'm standing mm -hmm. in for our president today. Um, a couple things before we get started. We have elections coming up in November, so if anybody wants to nominate yourself or somebody else to fill any of the director positions or the officer positions, please let us know. At our next meeting in September, we'll take official nominations and put out the notice of attendees in October and have elections in November. So please keep that part in mind. Also, this is the last time we're offering Zoom as an option for our meetings. Starting in September, we will only offer in-person lunch meetings. We will continue to have the meetings available online afterwards because we'll continue to record them for posterity's sake. And you'll be able to get to that on our website after the fact. All of that in effort to boost our numbers at lunch. So that being, all the business being out of the way. Oh, wait a minute. Is that the, the no, it's not all the business, is it? Minutes. Minutes. Sure. Which we haven't gotten because the newsletter is stuck in the mail somewhere. So we're going to have to postpone the. Well, ask for a move to waive the meeting, reading of the minutes. A second? All those in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. So, then we'll move to Caroline's report, the treasurer's report. Good afternoon. I learned from watching the uh, video last night. Okay, we currently have $6,400 in our checking account for our operating expenses. So midpoint, midway through the year, we are, I think we are in a good position to cover our operating ex expenses. Um, thank you to everyone who has renewed. Oh, thank you to everyone who has renewed your membership and those that have um, contributed donations, which has helped bolster our um, operating income. And for those who still have, have yet to uh, renew, we're going to be calling you because after uh, this meeting, the newsletters, which came out late this, this time, but um, we, we will have to cut you off because 35 approximately $35 uh, per member is the cost of sending out the newsletter. So it's very important to, um, uh, to renew your memberships. So um, that's it. Oh, and if anybody, we, we, we're now taking credit cards. And oh, our, yes. our webmaster, Bill Brown, has updated our website so that you can also pay in advance for your luncheons. And, um, and renew your memberships online. So that concludes the Treasurer's Report. New member? Did you do that? Caroline's also going to tell us about the new members. Oh, we have to vote on new members. This is very important. My membership chair hat. Well, we have a new member from last luncheon in May who wasn't here when I was making the presentation, so I'd like to introduce Clifteen Jones. <laughs> Clifteen is a native Washingtonian. Her late father graduated from Dunbar High School, which was my father's alma mater. 
and um, she was invited to join by Judy Hubbard. And last, our last luncheon date would have been her parents' anniversary. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Judy. Thank you. And so we have some um, some new members, some more new members. Um, Allie Latimer, who who's not able to be here today, and she's a retired attorney, Howard University Law School alum, a member of, oh, there she is, perfect timing. <laughs> Allie is here. Um, she helped organize the federally employed women, yes, you may, um, few, which advocated for equal employment opportunity in the federal government for women. She found out about AOI from a brochure left at Ingleside at Rock Creek, where she resides. So welcome, Allie. And Denise Diane Voigt, is that Voigt um, who's not here today. Uh, she's retired. Her parents are members of uh, AOI, Robert and Noreen Voigt. Uh, her spouse, Frank Leone, is co-chair of the Foggy Bottom Association's History Project and is a longtime resident of DC. They um, think AOI offers some wonderful opportunities to learn about DC history. And they heard about, uh, she and her husband heard about AOI from her parents. Cheryl, Cheryl Chapman Henderson, who's my, sis, my oldest sister, <laughs> Uh, she's a family law attorney. She's a daughter, of course, of um, the late AOI uh, member, Clinton Chapman, my dad, and a graduate of Western High School. And of course, she found out about AOI from my father as well. And we have a new member as of uh, that she filled out her membership today, Pamela Johnson. <laughs> hey, Pam. Pam, um, Of course, you know, all, all, roads, all roads lead to Judy Hubbard. So Judy encouraged Pam to join. That's her table. And Pam is the, um, uh, the, uh, runs the women's, the, the education department at the WNDC, which is the foundation, which the Women's Educational Foundation of the WNDC, who are our hosts, of course. I would like to welcome all the new members. We need a motion to accept the new members. And a second. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. Aye. Now I'd like to invite our esteemed speaker today, Mr. Peter Sefton. He's been involved in historic preservation of Washington since 2002. He sat on the board of the DC Preservation League since 2007. Are you still on the board? And he continues to be on the board. <laughs> He'll be speaking about architect Nathan Wyatt and specifically the Recorder of Deeds building in downtown Washington. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> you, you come on. Give a second for the slides. I hope you can uh, hear me all right. Uh, if you can't, wave your hand or something like that. Uh, I'm Peter Sefton, and actually this building is a bit of a test. Um, if, like most of us, you've lived in Washington for maybe 15 years or more, uh, you're probably pretty familiar with it, and it doesn't need an introduction. But if you're newer to the city, it's maybe a little bit of a mystery. Uh, from its architecture, you can probably tell that it's a government building, even without reading the name on the cornerstone. But if you've never been inside, and in fact, you've never seen anybody going in or out. If we get to the next slide. Whether you're a new or an established Washingtonian, uh, this deserted air is doubly odd because the building is on a really prime downtown corner. It's just across the street from the Moultrie Courthouse and it's up the block from police headquarters and around the corner from Judiciary Square. Could we have the next slide? 
Uh, this index card tells us some facts that might be familiar, but today we're going to dig a little bit deeper and address three questions that the Recorder of Deeds Buildings poses. The first is how it represents African Americans' struggle for political and social rights. And the second is how the building's extraordinary fusion of history, art, and architecture make it a national symbol of African American achievement. And the third question is, how could such a civic treasure have fallen into its current state? Next slide. Let's begin by briefly reminding ourselves of what the Recorder of Deeds Office does. Uh, I'm sure you heard people that it, uh, when they buy a house saying they have to get the deed recorded down at the courthouse. Well, in the district, that function is conducted by the Office of the Recorder of Deeds, which is the official repository for property deeds and other legal documents uh, that control property and uh, also documents like incorporations and uh, other things that assert sort of rights over something. Um, we have the Recorder of Deeds because during the Civil War, the district's population nearly doubled. And there was a great deal of building, and it was chaotic, and the system of property in the city became so disordered that Congress created a position to try to get a handle on it. Um, however, this recorder's authority was very unclear, and the system was ineffectual. However, in 1869, Congress systematized the position and made it responsible for recording all deeds, contracts, and other instruments in writing affecting the title or ownership of any real estate or personal property, much the same function the office serves today. Uh, next slide. The first two recorders under this modern system were white. The first was, I'm sorry, we're one ahead. Could we go back one? The first was Simon Wolf, a lawyer who, when President Grant offered to appoint him the job, reputedly said something like, uh, thank you, but I don't really think so. But when Wolf heard that some people opposed his getting the job because he was Jewish, he told Grant, in essence, I'm not going to knuckle under, knuckle under to these bigots. I want the job, and I'm going to do it in a way that you know will, will completely uh, refute all of these nasty things they've said about me. And Wolf was, by all accounts, a really successful recorder. Um, one of his early acts was to hire Frederick Douglass Jr., the son of the great abolitionist and civil rights leader, as a clerk. If we could see the next slide. Um, James Garfield is a tragic figure. He was inaugurated in March and fatally wounded in July. But during his brief time in office, he appointed the great Frederick Douglass Sr. to be the third recorder of deeds. Garfield appointed several other African Americans to important positions. And in this chromium lithograph from the Library of Congress, you can see his portrait on the banner right between Lincoln and Grant. So he's a person who had great stature in the African American community. Um, Douglas took over an office that had a staff of about 30 to 40 clerks and copyists who did, did a great deal more than filing records. Um, basically, if you bought a piece of property, you'd bring the signed deed in to have it recorded and made official. Uh, there was, of course, no way to copy documents except by hand. And the copyists would copy your deed into big ledgers called Liebers. And the uh, copied pages would be certified and stamped as the official legal record of your ownership. The copyist charged by the word and by the page, and they kept one-third of the fee. Uh, the recorder received two-thirds of the, pay, the fee, and he used that to pay the clerks and copyists and just do the general running of the office. Um, and he was compensated not really by a salary, but by the difference between what the office took in and what it cost to run it, at least during the 19th century. Douglas once said that the recorder position was the most lucrative federal position besides president. So you can imagine there's a lot of competition to get that job. Um, <clears throat> but the recorder's office had a diverse staff even before Douglas took over, and he, although he was the one who hired its first black female copyist. By the end of his tenure, the staff was about two-thirds women and almost equally divided between African Americans and whites doing really the same tasks. Uh, there's Blanche Bruce, who was later a recorder of deeds, and um, uh, well, this is on the banner up above, uh, and then I'm not sure who the third person was. I can't, you know, read it on the uh, slide. He was not, however, a future recorder of deeds. Um, 
So at any rate, um, if we see the next slide. Being a nationally prominent figure was uh, no insulation against racist attacks at all. And even though Douglas was generally considered to be uh, both a national hero and an excellent recorder, there was a combination of envy at his lucrative position, resentment at an African American man having authority over white women employees, and also a very, you know, the very deeply imbued general racism of the day. And that made Douglas the target of ceaseless insinuations about his honesty, his marriage, his competence, his character, uh, even his intellectual ability. And uh, some of these uh, attacks are a lot, uh, are, are really far uglier than what I've put up here. I thought we would maybe spare us ourselves some of them. Uh, but they were really ugly and they just kept on the whole time he was recorder. And although he was succeeded by an African American and a bipartisan consensus evolved that the recorder position should always be filled by an African American, each recorder who followed him, and I think there were 10, uh, you know, into the early 20th century, had similar personal attacks and calls for the position to really be filled by a white man. It's a very shameful episode. Uh, see the next slide. Things didn't change much in the 20th century. Woodrow Wilson was strongly lobbied by local members of the Democratic Party to appoint a white recorder. They argued that this was a home rule issue. The recorder had been chosen hitherto for by national political leaders as a reward for services that were performed far from Washington. We want home rule and the power to name the local person we want and of course we would only want a white person. Uh, as you see from these newspaper headlines, this was a very sophisticated campaign. Uh, the local people uh, enlisted congressional representatives, including a really infamous segregationist whose name may be familiar, Benjamin Vardaman from Mississippi. And um, Wilson listened to them. Uh, he appointed a white local Democratic committeeman named John Costello, who served for his whole administration. Costello didn't do a particularly bad or particularly good job according to his reputation, but uh, when Warren Harding, a Republican, was elected in 1920, he replaced Costello with an African-American lawyer and reinstituted the bipartisan tradition of having the recorder be an African-American. And to understand how important this was even in the 1920s, which is starting to get into modern times, um, and how prestigious the recorder's job was, Consider that there were less than a half dozen major federal government positions that African Americans could routinely hold. Um, in addition, the recorder of deeds of the District of Columbia was the only municipal position in the country that was a federal job and that required a nomination by the president and confirmation by the Senate itself. Um, so it's not too surprising that whoever was recorder was a national figure and they got national attention in the African American press. Uh, let's see the next slide. Uh, you might ask what the recorders, where the recorder's office was performing all these essential tasks. And the answer is that in reality, it was a homeless, it was a homeless office. Uh, this was an awkward situation, of course, because it had a big staff, of course, of copyists and clerks. But it had a tremendous library of these Liebers with the deeds in them. And these things are heavy. If you've ever lifted one, they can weigh up to 20 pounds each. So in 1908, when the district government uh, essentially moved out of Old City Hall, which you know is today uh, the DC Superior Court building down in Judiciary Square, and it migrated to the new district building on Pennsylvania Avenue, the reporter's office couldn't go with it because so much of its work was tied up with the court systems. And so it bounced around. It was put in leased office space for a while around Judiciary Square, and it was sometimes split among locations. The books might be in one place and most of the clerks and copyists in another. Uh, one temporary location was the building you see here. It's a decrepit building called the Walker Building and it stood where police headquarters uh, stands today roughly, fourth in Louisiana at the time. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the picture. It's photographed in spring. All the windows are as wide open as you can get them because the staff was sweltering and uh, so much for climate controlled preservation of these uh, you know, priceless city records. Uh, so, and the office periodic, it wasn't secure, 
for a lot of reasons. The office periodically had small fires, and they could have really reduced the uh, property records of the city to ash had they gotten going. And um, the recorders, to a, to a man, would plead with Congress and say, and I don't, I'm not caricaturing here really, uh, saying, look, we're a disaster waiting to happen. And Congress would say, yeah, you know, you're right, you are a disaster, but you're not getting any money this year. So the situation just stumbled on, you know, with the office moving from place to place. And uh, at any rate, we're now going to talk about why the Walker Building is no longer around. Happier story. See the next slide. Under Franklin Roosevelt, a very remarkable leader became recorder. And I, I think if there's one thing that comes out of this, it's just what an effective man he was. Uh, Dr. William Tompkins was a former hospital superintendent from Kansas City, Missouri, who got his start working on Harry Truman's early senatorial campaigns. And he was a civil rights activist and civic leader in Kansas City. But he was also, in addition to that, a very efficient and savvy person who had run a very major hospital. And he's a very astute handler of Congress and public relations, as we'll see. And he's really the force behind the building of the, of the Recorder of Deeds building. And we'll see the next slide. Back in 1926, during the Coolidge administration, Congress announced that they were going to build the Federal Triangle. And in the process, they were going to tear down about 10 square blocks of the city. Uh, and that included several important district buildings, and for a time, even the district building itself, which, you know, was pretty new. It was about 25 years old, but, you know, it's really not up to snuff what we would want for a federal agency. I mean, you know. So it was, it was on the chopping block, and it was supposed to go. Um, the district commissioners protested that very strongly, and they uh, asked for a tract of land within the triangle to be dedicated to district buildings, and they were just refused. Uh, but gradually, a plan took shape for the very uh, outmoded city courthouses to be replaced by modern buildings in Judiciary Square, which is where the McMillan plan wanted to put them in the first place. Um, and a police headquarters and other administrative buildings would be built in these squares you see here that are bounded by Pennsylvania Avenue on the south, Judiciary Square on the north, and then roughly by 3rd and 6th Streets to the east and west. At that point, the district committee, which really was the funnel through which money passed to the city, uh, was run by very conservative Midwestern Republicans who basically were into cutting government. And they were not into building a municipal center campus a thousand miles from home. Uh, it was not going to play in their home district. Uh, and so it's, it's not exaggerating much to say the, the attitude on Capitol Hill was, uh, you can have your municipal center and we'll pay half. You'll pay half, and by the way, we're not going to give you your, our half. So that situation continued for you know a number of years. Uh, each one of the little pink triangles, rectangles rather, you see here, was a building that had to be bought from its owner and torn down. So the project obviously was proceeding pretty slowly. By 1930, they were actually tearing down a few buildings, but by then the depression had hit, and whatever. Uh, money the district was getting from Congress was being reprogrammed to unemployment relief just to keep people eating. Um, and after uh, the New Deal began in 1933, there was more money available for public works, but there was also a general perception that uh, the district was already getting quite a bit of federal money, really maybe more than its share, and you know, also they couldn't vote. But, you know, so that was, that was another problem. But then, in 1936, a congresswoman from New Jersey got the Municipal Center project rolling. And see the next slide. Mary, Th Mary Thompson from uh, Jersey City had won the nickname Battling Mary because she had a really pugnacious style and just really took no prisoners, you know, did not recognize obstacles. And as chair of the district committee uh, when the Democrats took control of Congress, she won a cent from the Roosevelt administration to appropriate funds to begin building, starting with the Judiciary Square courthouses. And this project fell across the direction of the municipal architect who you see here in a caricature, Nathan C. Wyeth. See the next slide. Nathan Wyeth was, uh, very, had so very much to do with the look and feel of the city that it seems strange he's not better known today. Uh, he began his career by designing some of the city's most elegant mansions, um, which you see here, one here that's by Sheridan Circle. 
And um, he also did a lot of civic commissions, such as the original Oval Office of the President. He did the titled basin as co-designer. And he also did the Key Bridge. Um, by 1929, he was, he was in his 60s, and he was probably about ready to retire. And then the stock market crash took away all his money. Uh, he even had to sell his house, it looks like. And so he went to work for the city full time. Uh, it was up in Spring Valley originally, although he ended up renting on uh, Wyoming Avenue for the rest of his life. But uh, Wyeth, um, if we see the next slide, Wyeth inherited the top architectural job when municipal architect Albert Harris died very suddenly in 1933, and he held the job until 1945. Under his direction, the office designed a, a portfolio of really great civic buildings and in just a wide variety of style. Uh, here you see the Georgian Revival Petworth Library and then the uh, Strip Classical uh, Art Modern Municipal Center. And these, these were all done in about the same year by the Office of the Municipal Architect in addition to a lot of others. Um, in part, this is because Wyeth was very receptive to the talents of his staff, many of whom were not like him, had not graduated from the Ecole de Beaux Arts in Paris. Um, one of the key ones was Arvid Kunzen, uh, who was a Latvian diplomat turned architect, who was the key associate who designed the municipal center building. And maybe he had some influence on the recorder of deeds. We don't know. We see the next slide. While Wyeth inherited plans for the municipal center campus from Harris, they were greatly refined during the half dozen years that took, you know, ensued before they had the money to begin construction. Uh, the final plan was never fully accomplished. Um, fortunately, they didn't let Wyeth tear down the pension building to build a new armory, which is one of his less good ideas. Uh, that's, of course, at the top of the, the image. Um, and the municipal auditorium, which is on the site of today's Prettyman Courthouse, which is down in the corner to your lower right, uh, was never funded and never built. Uh, but uh, after the Commission of Fine Arts decreed that the vista along John Marshall Place had to remain open, he split his proposed municipal center building into two modules, only the east of which was completed. That's today's police headquarters, and the Moultrie Courthouse eventually took the site of the west module. Um, then there were two subsequent buildings that were built after the municipal, municipal center before war uh, really shut down construction. Um, one was the first of two buildings for a new municipal library. And that, uh, the second module was never built and that was torn down to make space for the Canadian Embassy. Um, and the second was the Recorder of Deeds building, our subject today, which is on that yellow rectangle you see, uh, you know, about halfway up on your left. The Recorder's office wasn't supposed to get a dedicated building in the original plan. But it certainly made sense, given how specialized its requirements really are. Um, Dr. Tompkins helped with some very well-considered lobbying. Uh, through the newspapers, he told the public that, hey, I'm afraid your deeds just really aren't safe. Uh, a lot of them are signed by people like Daniel Webster and other famous figures. People are going to start stealing them just to get those valuable autographs. And um, if we don't have a fire first, that is, uh, and, you know, so what I'm thinking is maybe we should give your deed to you. Uh, you can take care of it. You can put it under your mattress. You can put it in your safe deposit box. You can frame it. You can do whatever. But it's going to be safer because our building just doesn't let us protect your deeds. So this made a big public outcry when it got in the paper. And it kind of pushed Congress over the, over the line where they knuckled under and they funded a dedicated recorder's building. Uh, so that's another one for Dr. Tompkins. See the next slide. The groundbreaking for the Deeds Building on September 26, 1940 was a gala event. FDR came himself. You see him here with Dr. Tompkins on his right and a Reverend Solomon Lightfoot Michaud, who was a very popular African-American evangelist on the radio, giving the invocation to his left. But what you don't see is that there's about to be a strike. There were some jurisdictional disputes between the AFL and CIO workers on the building. And almost as soon as Roosevelt pushed the button to make the symbolic first steam shovel dig, uh, one of the unions shut the job down and moved the steam shovel off site. 
Uh, eventually it came back, but the, with the war looming, materials were in really short supply, especially steel for the windows and the framing of the building. And um, about a year after the groundbreaking, the United States was in a war. So by 1943, when the building was finally ready, uh, Dr. Tompkins was already fatally ill, and he died within the year. Uh, he never really got to really stay in the, you know, use the building very much. And um, it, it, as it happened, uh, you know, the building was never dedicated formally. Uh, we see the next uh, slide. Despite its austere design, the recorder building is a handsome example of what has been called the stripped classical style. Uh, it is inset window ribbons that make the areas in between them look like the piers on a classical building. Uh, around the entrance, the limestone is carved to suggest pillars with capitals. And across the top, you have this frieze of wheat sprouts, which is also on the uh, roofline cornice. With limited materials, it's actually quite a handsome building, although the identity of its designer is not really known on the, on the municipal architect's staff. See the next slide. In the new building, Deeds finally got fireproof storage space in basement vaults. There were three above ground stories with a roof cafeteria for the employees. And the upper floor had offices for the copyists and clerks. The second floor had a recorder's office and a library. But the public area was the first floor, uh, whose blueprint you see here. From one of the main entrances on D Street, you'd come into a vestibule that connected to the central lobby where the clerks sat. And it was kind of like a hotel. You went up to the desk there that's uh, about midway across the picture, and you, you did your business with the clerk. Um, and let's say you needed to look at your deed. At the clerk's request, the lever with the deed would be bought up from the basement vaults by elevator. And you'd walk back into the reading room, which is the huge rectangle towards the top of your screen, and you'd look at it. The reading room's huge, and its ceiling is actually the bottom of a three-story light well. So the squares you see drawn on it are all panes in the skylights, which mostly light it by daylight rather than electric illumination. This is a building that worked very, very well, but its most remarkable feature is the gallery of murals that are really part of the building itself. And we'll take a whirlwind tour. Next slide. The Recorder of Deeds murals were the last project of the government office that created the art programs of so many federal buildings. A lot of people were surprised to hear that this was the Treasury Section of Fine Arts, not the WPA. The Treasury Department was involved in art and buildings because the Office of the Supervisory Architect of the Treasury was in control of civilian federal buildings until GSA was founded in 1949. The Section of Fine Arts typically got 1% of the construction budget of each federal building to purchase art for it. Um, for larger projects, like the Recorder Building, the section would develop a theme, they'd put out a request for designs, and then they'd stage a competition in which the entries would be evaluated by a jury of section staff and artists. Um, that's what the section did for the Recorder of Deeds building in 1942. But the key figure in the competition was, surprise, Dr. Tompkins. Uh, Dr. Tompkins was on the jury, which also included the head of the Howard University Art Department and other artists, muralists, section officials. But his biggest contribution was he devised the theme for the mural project, which was African American achievements in, Afri in American history. And he determined the uh, detailed scenarios for each of the seven murals that would be in the building. This was all Dr. Thompson's invention, really. And we're going to take a whirlwind tour now, but first let's just consider his overall themes. The subjects of all seven murals we're going to see show interracial cooperation and, and collaboration. But there's, an, there's a layer of complexity on that. While almost all of the murals address historic events that have white heroes, um, they really center on African Americans who were instrumental to that success, as well as sometimes uh, really being instrumental to the hero's very survival. Um, Dr. Tompkins selected military, or at least military collected events, connected events for five of the seven murals. And that really projects the, the wartime ideal of unity and everybody pushing together. Because in 1942, the United States was not definitely on the offensive yet, and the outcome of the war was really in doubt. Um, interestingly, the only two murals that depict events that happened in Washington, there's just two of them. This reinforces the perception that unlike the murals in the small town post office or your local city hall that depict scenes from local history of your community, 
The Recorder of Deeds building is a municipal services building who nonetheless has national civic importance. It shows, the, it shows nationally important events in the murals. Um, after the winning designs were selected from 167 unsigned sketches from 127 artists, a lot of attention and publicity went to the fact that the winning entries represented all sections of this country, and about half the artists were women. But there was much less attention paid to the fact that only one of the artists was an African American. This was despite Dr. Tompkins' very intense efforts uh, to publicize and open the competition to what he, uh, which he called the uh, first time for African American artists to, de to depict historic scenes of African Americans in a major government building. It was huge. He ran article or uh, advertisements in the African American community papers all over the country, contacted African American colleges, and um, but he didn't, uh, it, it did not end up that African American artists won many of the commissions. But now let's let the art speak for itself. Uh, see the next slide. Uh, Ethel Magadan, uh, frequently the muralist of this uh, mural, frequently collaborated on paintings with her sister. Uh, their styles were so similar that it was said you couldn't tell where one's brush left off and the others began. She did do this one entirely herself, though. Uh, she painted major murals at the Senate and what is now the Department of Health and Human Services headquarters, as well as this very large mural, which is 14 feet long. Uh, what it shows is Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New, Orle New Orleans being assisted by what are presumably enslaved African Americans who under fire are piling cotton bales to stop his troops from being riddled by British sharpshooters. One of Dr. Thompson's themes, the essential contribution of African Americans, who really the white hero is sort of standing on the shoulders of. Uh, next slide, please. Maxine Sealbinder's Benjamin Banneker is the only mural that indisputably shows a scene from DC history. And it's also one of the two murals that depicts a, na a non military event. Sealbinder was quite a political progressive. And she published a lot of illustrations in publications like New Masses uh, in New York City. And while Ethel Magadan's mural is a pretty conventional style mural, uh, Sealbinder represents a tradition that was very popular and had a lot of resonance in the 1930s. And that is that it's kind of a proletarian, uh, slightly cartoonish style that's vivid enough that it would grab people's attention if you uh, painted it on an exterior wall. It's kind of... Uh, you know, al almost sort of agitprop in a way. Um, this shot that you see here next to it of Sealbinder working on the Banneker mural in her studio in California illustrates how the murals were created. The artists worked in their homes and uh, they would mail the treasury section versions of their proposed designs which were called cartoons. The section would say, okay, you're on the right track, go ahead. Or you need to change this in this way. And they were pretty critical. Um, they would go through a bunch of iterations before approving anything. And the final cartoon would be a half-sized dress rehearsal drawing. And when that was approved, the mural would be painted on linen and shipped off to Washington. Each artist paid to have their mural uh, installed by a specialist from New York who f fixed it uh, in, in, with the intention it was permanently affixed to the wall. So rather than paintings that are hung in a building, these murals really became part of it. Uh, let's see the next slide. Here's another non-military subject. This is uh, by Austin Mecklen, who was an artist from the Hudson Valley of New York, who was a very noted magazine illustrator and, and teacher. Uh, he's showing Matthew Henson, who was really the person who got the Robert Peary expedition to the North Pole. There's a little bit of a local flavor because Matthew Henson was from Montgomery County, Maryland. So it's not DC, but it's, it's, it's close. Everyone see the next slide. The artist who created Colonel Shaw and his regiment has generated a whole lot of interest in the last couple years. Cuban-born Carlos Lopez is recognized as a pioneering Latino artist who practiced in the United States. He was based in Detroit and he died of a stroke just when he was really starting to catch on and get museum exhibitions. Uh, it was very sad. Um, the charge at Fort Wagner was very tragic. Uh, Shaw was wounded and most of his African-American troops were killed, many of them after they were taken prisoner. Uh, in this uh, 
mural commemorates the sacrifice of the whole regiment, troop, sand leader. And I think it's one of the most vibrant and dynamic murals in the whole of the District of Columbia. If we could see the next slide. Herschel Levitt depicts Crispus Attucks as a heroic martyr among a crowd of white colonists who are being fired upon, even though they're unarmed, by British troops after basically throwing snowballs on the Boston Common. Uh, Levitt was an illustrator and photographer who became a very noted graphic designer in the 1950s. You might have some of the record album covers he did in your collection if you're still in the vinyl. He did a lot of jazz album covers in a very edgy kind of abstract style, including a pretty famous Miles Davis one. Uh, while his mural is extremely expressive, it, it is in an essentially conservative design, and that echoes the philosophy of the treasury section of fine arts which had absolutely zero tolerance for abstraction of any type. Do not want to go there with them. Uh, the next slide. You might question my arithmetic here because I count this picture as a local scene even though it takes place within the White House. And it, it shows a national event. I'm also counting it as a military related scene because what Douglas is imploring Lincoln to do is to let African Americans serve in the Union Army. William Edward Scott, uh, who painted it, it was the only African American among the Deeds muralists. And he's likely the most accomplished and established artist in the whole group. He attended the Art Institute of Chicago, and he studied in Paris as well. And he executed more than 75 mural commissions, including some very notable ones at the 1933 Chicago Century of Progress World's Fair. Scott was adamant as, as an artistic model that his Paintings should show persons of color, not just in roles like slaves or servants, but in positions of authority and responsibility. And he, he sought these kinds of commissions out. Um, this mural helps capture the gravity of the conversation through the very somber uh, color tones that Scott uses. And also note how all the eyes are on Douglas in the, in the picture, not on Lincoln. Uh, next slide, please. Our seventh and final mural is Cyrus Tiffany at the Battle of Lake Erie during the War of 1812. This is our most controversial mural because there's actually a conspiracy theory here. Uh, take a very close look. Do you see anything odd? Okay, well, let's look at the next slide. I'm going to give you a hint. Commodore Perry is holding the sword in his left hand. Okay, big deal, right? But Actually, the section saw it as a huge deal and immediately started writing to Martel Schweig, the artist, who was a 22-year-old painter who lived with her parents in St. Louis. And they were asking her, why in the world is that sword in his left hand? You're going to make another problem. Uh, a year before, Schweig had done a post office mural in Kansas that was attacked by a pretty vicious poison pen campaign. Um, the letters falsely claimed that all of her wheat threshers were holding their scythes in their left hands. So we see left hand, scythe, scythe is a sickle, hammer and sickle, connect those dots. Wow. Uh, so a conflict that went on for some time uh, ensued between Schweig and the section, with Washington pressing her to change her design and asking, why are you so sure Perry was left-handed? And Schweig responding, well, why does that matter? So finally, Schweig was just iron-willed, even though she's a very young person starting her career, and she declared, look, Perry was ambidextrous, I'm deciding, and you know, we're gonna leave the sword in his left hand. So she, she went out and she got to paint her design without completely having to you know, scavenge it, but the section did later get a very racist poison pen letter from St. Louis which is in their files at the Smithsonian. And it included a newspaper photograph of the mural cartoon with the left hand holding the sword underlined it very strongly with a red pencil. Um, so we see scythe, sword, left hand. There's a conspiracy here behind the mural and the red pencil owner had unearthed it and exposed it, at least in his and her mind. Um, see the next slide. William Edward Scott has commissioned to paint Groundbreaking Day, which is an oil painting, by Dr. Tompkins, who wanted to commemorate the celebratory feel of the building's birth moment and Roosevelt's participation in it. Uh, you can see that uh, Roosevelt 
is, is kind of uh, doing an aside with Dr. Tompkins at the exact center of the uh, picture. And this painting, which hung in the recorder's personal office, is also notable because Scott, probably at the direction of others, added people who weren't there and shuffled the seating chart to put other individuals closer to FDR than they really were. Um, uh, There's pretty heavy artistic license, but uh, the painting does capture the spirit of the moment. It's, you know, a very cheerful, bright, open treatment of it. And, you know, of course, the building of the deeds office was, you know, that kind of a moment for the people involved. But, and by the way, do you notice the women in the front row here? Uh, they do stand out. They're the first female figures you've seen in any of the pictures we've looked at so far. Every figure in every one of the seven murals is male. And despite having half female artists. Um, we can see the next slide, I guess. Finally, we're going to look at the Four Freedoms plaque, which was not originally commissioned for the recorder building. African American sculptor Selma Burke had two sittings with FDR, but Eleanor Roosevelt hated the results. Unfortunately, FDR died before his third sitting could be staged. The existing version was cast and added to the building in 1945 as a memorial to the recently deceased president. And its dedication was held two weeks after Hiroshima, and it was just as somber as the groundbreaking had been festive. Uh, president Truman spoke about the contrast between Roosevelt's dream of universal or international brotherhood and nuclear annihilation, which was just a subject that was very much on everybody's mind that day. Um, next slide. Later, Selma Burke claimed that the bust on the Roosevelt dime that appeared in 1946 was lifted from her work. And there's been a lot written about this in the, just in the last year. And um, I, I have to throw the floor open. What do you think? You have to look at it and try and make up your own mind. Um, finally, if we can see the next slide, uh, I hope we have seen here why the recorder of deeds position is so associated with African American struggle for political and social rights and how the recorder building became a tremendous symbol of social and political achievement. I think these factors are underlined by the building's highly accomplished stripped classical style, which symbolizes the modernity that was at least a, an ideal of the New Deal. Uh, constructing the recorder's building in this style reinforced the importance of the recorder's office, as well as making a very powerful statement of inclusion uh, and it was a symbolic validation of African Americans' contribution to the city and the nation at a time of legitimate national peril. The building and its style and its murals really present architecture as political symbolism, and I think very successfully. Uh, surely, today, it's very difficult to walk west from the recorder building or the municipal center and not feel that the neoclassical federal triangle buildings represent the political relationships of a much earlier era. Uh, Finally, we didn't answer our third question, what's been done with the, this civic jewel? And the answer is the recorder building served its original functions for more than 65 years. Its murals are, were viewed by high school classes, and on other occasions the building was open for public tours. In 2005, its murals and rich history were acknowledged by a city historical marker. But after the recorder's office moved to Southwest in 2008, the building was relegated to storage, and it became much harder to get in and see the murals. Um, in 2010, it was temporarily flooded, and then it became totally inaccessible. It was mothballed, and people were not really supposed to go in or out. And shortly afterwards, at the DC Preservation League, we filed a landmark nomination that remained unheard by, for seven years. But finally, in 2019, the Deeds Building was designated a district landmark and entered on the National Register. So that's something. Um, Although the, um, uh, if we see the next slide, although the building was closed to the public in the, in the late 19 teens, rumors circulated that the roof had developed major leaks that were potentially putting the murals at risk. Actually, if we go one slide further, we can see that. Uh, up there in the right corner. These images are from the period that preceded the repairs. The major damage in, in the one picture is in the office areas on the upper floors which don't contain murals. And the second mural, the second image shows the murals as they look today. They're behind silver tape and it looks like particle board. Uh, we're told they're probably okay. I don't think anybody's looked, but we hope. Um, if we can go back one slide now. Thank you. 
Although the roof repairs are complete, the Deeds building continues to suffer from deterioration and very bad maintenance. Uh, it has open joints in the limestone panels and let water in. Uh, the limestone is spalling very badly. You can kind of see that a little on the cornerstone that the names of the people connected with it are getting kind of expunged. And uh, it, uh, its original steel sashes are still in place, but they're rusting and they're not sealed to the building. Um, although it's rumored to be under consideration for occupancy by a court-related agency, uh, nothing's happening very fast, and that would also raise the question, uh, would the public still have access to the murals? Um, so we have a fourth question, really, an extra one besides our third, which is, when will this building receive the rehabilitation it deserves, and when will it be reopened for public view? Uh, I throw that open to the floor. Thanks for coming. Oh, we got a wonderful certificate for you. Oh, great! It's, it, it's presented to Stephen Sefton, Peter Sefton, for his presentation pertaining to Nathan Wyatt, the architect and the recorder of Deeds Building, the Association of Oldest Inhabitants of the District of Columbia. Thank you very much. And this will, will have a privileged posi position on my wall. And you get one of our very oh. exclusive challenge coins. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. If there are any questions, I'm of course glad to answer. We're going to get. I got to get to sure. Nelson first. Okay. Oh. Nelson, I apologize. We don't get any cash awards for coming, but we oh. give you a bag of goodies. Oh, all right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Enjoy. It will no, no part of it will be wasted. Oh yeah, no, no. I, I'm glad glad to entertain any questions you have. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, Rebecca Miller, are you uh, going to be here tomorrow evening, Rebecca Miller? Uh, have you been in touch with her? Uh, she and I once approached uh, uh, Nathan or somebody like that about it years ago, and I followed up, and maybe she had too, but. Uh, I'm in touch with Rebecca Miller constantly. She's our executive director, and I'm co-chair of the Landmarks Committee. So yes, and we've talked about the Deeds Building many times. What is, what is the preservation agency doing? Well, we're agitating very hard. We're lobbying for some attention to be paid for the building. I think we were pretty important in getting the roof fixed. We kept their feet to the fire on that one. Uh, Rebecca actually took those horror pictures of the inside of the building with the falling plaster and the you know, in, in 2020, uh, she was able to, to get in, and first person from DCPL had been in there in 10 years, despite constant lobbying. Uh, you have a frustrating situation, I think, where some district agencies are very much in favor of rehabilitating, preserving the building, getting it back into use, and then others seem to have no interest at all and to actually be obstructive. Uh, I don't want to say there's a civil war in the district government, but uh, everybody is not the family is not being nice at the table. This isn't the question I was going to ask you, but isn't it on DCPL's most endangered list? And doesn't that list get a lot of publicity? Uh, first part is true. It has periodically been on our most endangered places list, and I think it, you will see it there again. The list does get publicity, uh, and we're hoping it'll be a lot of publicity. We depend a lot on word of mouth about the list, so when our list comes out, which our, our latest one will come out, I think, pretty soon, uh, if people talk it up and bring it to the attention of other people, and we can get kind of a chain going that way, I think maybe that may bring, you know, the situation to some uh, critical mass. And what agency owns the building? Uh, I believe this District Department of General Services has uh, at least custody of it. Right, but it's it's owned by the. I believe it is actually owned by them. I haven't you know checked beyond that. District 
Department of General Services has been administering it. We'll put it that way. I assume they do own it. I have a question. Yeah. Um, was that building ever where birth certificates for Washingtonians were registered and archived? I, I don't believe so. It's property records. I think those would be at, at the Department of Health, which was in the Municipal Center, which Municipal. is another troubled building, which is now largely vacant. The Municipal Center. So we Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Because I have yeah. this very vivid memory of um, I my parents didn't give me a middle name when I was born. They claimed that I helped choose it when I was three years old. Hey, and then good for and you. then we had to go and register it. And my memory of the building we went to is that building, but it could have been the municipal could have been the municipal uh, building. Probably. That was one of the original functions in the municipal center building. Yeah. Uh, it also, another question that comes up a lot is, if you got married, did that happen in the Deeds building? No, uh, no it didn't. It probably happened in the municipal court, which is another Wyeth-designed municipal center building across Judiciary Square. That's where I got married, so I know that for a fact. Other questions? I, I know also for the recorder of deeds because AOI's corporate registration was there. I think yeah. there were a lot of corporate registrations yeah. that were maintained at the recorder of deeds building as well. Absolutely right. Corporate charters and corporations. You have the next question, so if you get your own um, I have a question on, on the uh, mural with uh, Edward Douglas. Um, <clears throat> obviously, Lincoln, and I think the fellow with the white beard is probably Gideon Wells and who's standing in the background is that would that be Stanton um, because of, uh, presumably the subject being asking for African Americans to serve militarily can you scroll back to that on your on your and we can take a look and uh, I don't have control of the slides possibly Cindy can I, I, I think that would be a very good guess. I probably should research that a little. It, it would depend more. on when the meeting took place. The um, Simon Cameron was the first uh, secretary. Right there. There we go. Now, if that took place before 1862, that would be Simon Cameron there to the left of Gideon Wells. And But it doesn't look like him particularly. It doesn't look like uh, Edwin Stanton, though. So I'm assuming that's probably when, when this meeting took place. Just, you know, curious about uh, the historical detail involved. Yeah, so I've wanted to look a little more closely at some of the detail about who's actually in the murals and also are the murals really historically accurate in every extent. That would be a good guess. Simon Cameron, uh, of course, was originally Lincoln's Secretary of War and he got kind of uh, fired, really, because he... Uh, um, some corruption issues, I think, and just general unpreparedness. I've always, uh, for many years, I was always confused, assumed that that it, that, that this N.C. Wyeth was the the father of Andrew Wyeth and uh, and Jamie Wyeth, grandfather. But is there any connection at all between the the two, just other than the fact they have the same surname, and the Wyeth, the Wyeth painter dynasty? And and the initials, the N. C. Wyeth, and Google has the same confusion. If you if you Google particularly N. C. Wyeth, you don't hear a lot about the architect. You do hear a lot about uh, Treasure Island and all those great illustrations. But um, and actually, Nathan C. Wyeth was a distinguished watercolorist. Uh, he actually, during World War I, had a pretty big job being director of hospital construction for the American Expeditionary Force. And he had a mental breakdown, I think you can tell from what hap was written about him after the war. He went from being a very bon vivant guy who taught fencing and was a tennis champion and social lion to being what for the rest of his life was described as a very shy and diffident person. And after the war, he took five years off and wandered around Europe and Switzerland painting watercolors as his therapy. So there are paintings by R. N. C. Wyeth out there, but it is not the children's book illustrator. I, I have a question. No. 
uh, uh, can these slides be made available to us? Uh, I think the question is, are, are the slides available for the group? I didn't hear the answer. You'll have to watch them or, or scroll through them going along with Peter's talk. It's not there as a separate presentation. Yeah. Okay, good. good. I, so it, 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 that, that answers it. Yeah, I did include my uh, email address there. I'm glad to respond to any personal questions. And before I stop, I, I do want to, this is probably against the rules, plug the book uh, that I recently wrote with my collaborator John DeFerrari, who's sitting right here. John, why, why don't you stand up for a minute, if you don't mind, or wave. <laughs> and our, it's, it's 16th Street, Washington's, uh, yeah, it, it's been, we've, yeah, yeah, we, we, we did that. We've done some walking tours and book talks, and it, it's kind of a biography of 16th Street, a little like it's a person, at least that's how I'd conceive of it. And, you know, it, it, um, it was a lot of fun to write, and John's a great collaborator. And uh, if you like the book, uh, it's for sale through Georgetown University Press and Amazon. And I probably wasn't allowed to do that commercial, but I did it. Oh, okay, good. Is that it for the questions? I swear I stepped well, I in here in Rick's place there. because we've got a little extra added attraction today before we turn the mic over to Nelson for his monthly trivia question. All Can right. Any questions? I think the lady with the red hat had a question, oh. maybe. Let me run back here. I didn't want to make a very quick question, but I did want to ask you. Thank you very much. I'm Allie Latimer, and I was general counsel of GSA. And when you mentioned GSA, it's archives mostly uh, because they, G, uh, archives used to be a part of GSA when they uh, created GSA in 1949, but then they thought that we were an administrative um, agency and they were closer to the Smithsonian. So they worked to get out from under GSA so they would not be thought of as somebody that bought cars and trucks <laughs> and built buildings. But what I wanted to ask you uh, was about the um, historic preservation of many of the private homes. I uh, lived in this neighborhood for a long time, and we bought Joan Bill Davis's house right up on uh, New Hampshire and S Street. And uh, they had asked me one time if we would take, would let them make that a historic site. And at first I said yes until they got, but this wasn't any part of Come here. Um, what they were going to put on it, they had, there was Bill Davis Sr., who was the first black um, uh, general in the country, and his son, Bill Davis Jr., uh, who was higher than his father as a general, uh, became the one that uh, started the airmen in Tuskegee and was in charge of that. And so when they sent me the plaque that they were going to put on it, they had made a mistake and had the talk about Bill Davis Sr. And then they had the next paragraph about Bill Davis Jr. So the only question I have is who is in, in charge of determining what is a historic site and what is not? Well, they, they have a review board downtown. And what happens is that nominations are sent to the review board, and the review board votes on them. And we, we at the Preservation League bring a lot of those nominations to them. We're not part of the city government, of course. And then the, preserva the Historic Preservation Review Board votes. And if they, they endorse the nomination, then it's designated as the landmark of the DC. 
Right, well, not necessarily, it can be. Like a historic district covers all the buildings within an area that meet particular criteria. And your house may be part of a historic district too, based on where it is. But same difference, I mean, we bring historic district nominations too, and the board votes. And they have final say, pretty much. Okay, so the next part of our little programs, thanks Peter. Um, excellent program. So back two years ago or so, as we were planning for the 2020 programs for AOI, between Barbara Bates and Sally Burke, we um, wanted to do something about the Recorder of Deeds building, and Peter stepped in, and if you go back, he was actually scheduled, I think, for June of 2020, which of course we cancel all but our February program. So at the same time, I think mainly because of Sally, I was contacted by, hold on one second, I was contacted, I do get my notes here, by Dr. Uh, Richard Walker, who's the director of the Living New Deal Project. And he's a professor emeritus of geography at UC Berkeley. And there's an organization called the livingnewdeal.org, and they have a beautiful series of pamphlets, one specific to Washington, D.C. So if e at each table today, there's one seat with the red dot on it. Now, how I ended up with the red dot on my finger, but I think it happened with the last speaker when I handed her the microphone. If you have a red dot on, the ch on your chair, there should be one at each table, and if it's a vacant chair, the first to grab it gets it. It, sh it, should, it should be on the top rail. Okay, so, so oh, Nelson has one. Okay, there you go. And, and John, and John Kreinheider has one. No, they, yeah, they should be on the top, on the rail of the chair. At John Kreinheider. Yes, the lady who just spoke. And what, what about the table here? Who, did you have one, Tom? Okay, well. So these pamphlets, if you're not lucky enough to be a winner, I think AOI has a few surplus ones that will be for sale for their co cost of $5 a piece. Or if you want to order your own or learn more about the organization, it's livingnewdeal, all one word, dot org. And, and the president won one. Rick, the president won one. Okay. No, 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 no only if you have a red dot. Okay, so now I'm going to turn this back over. Nelson, rather than pass the mic and all, are you ready for your trivia question? Yeah, okay. So now Nelson has a trivia question, so when he poses the question, and do you have your goodie bag? Are there goodie bags or something? Okay. Okay, okay. So just remember to raise your hand. Please don't shout out the answers. We can keep this organized. I did want to make one reference. To, reference was made to the district building. There was a movements in the 1980s and 90s to have the federal government take over the district building. They were interested in obtaining it, and the district government was very ambivalent about keeping it. And Mark Plotkin, who was a member of this organization around for many years, opposed it. The council put out a report on the district building, and one of their major criticism of the building was it didn't mend itself to good or efficient government because the rooms in the building were either too large or too small. There you go. <laughs> I don't know what size they said, think that the, is most efficient for government operations, but maybe we'll work on that. <clears throat> Well, they, you know, maybe they're, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> Tell me how many the original period one was tied on the small side. Mm hmm. <laughs> okay, my first question, Libby, trivia question is name the first lady who told her husband, the president elect, that upon taking residence in the White House, she would not be attending any events at segregated facilities or businesses or places that did not admit 
ser admit or serve people of color in the District of Columbia. Should I repeat that? Did everybody get it? Well, if both hands went up here, I'm not sure which. Okay. No, that's, that's a very good guess, but not it. <laughs> Mamie Eisenhower, you got it. There you go. And the roots of her efforts I have here in an article that I wrote for the Post if you'd like to read more about it. They're right there at the, my, t my chair. Yep, they're all the same, so they can just be distributed. <laughs> Okay, name the first lady who is a graduate with honors of Yale University School of Law, but who flunked the District of Columbia bar examination. This is a toughie. <laughs> who? You got it. <laughs> and, and, uh, Bernstein uh, wrote a, a biography of her, and he got her to admit in an interview, he said, did you ever just think of taking the exam a second time? And she said, no, I was afraid I'd flunk it twice. <laughs> <laughs> Name the first lady who testified before the U.S. House Committee on the District of Columbia in support of legislation to, to provide for an elected local government and amending the Constitution for D.C. voting representation in Congress. Yep. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> I'll give you one next year. <laughs> okay, Eleanor Roosevelt's got it over here. But that, 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 uh, that, that's, uh, that's the correct answer. That was in 1940. And... Uh, hmm? Yes, I did one time, I brought it, yes. A picture of her testifying, that's right. That's right, yep. As I say, I have copies of, uh, of the Eisenhower administration and the efforts that, uh, that uh, Mamie Eisenhower put into, uh, um, she, she was very adamant about it. She said, to, to, she said, Ike, I just will not go out to any place in the District of Columbia that's, that's segregated or does not serve people of color. The first things they got integrated were the movie theaters. And Ike and A. Mamie appeared directly to the moguls of the movie straight industry and got the theaters and movie theaters in D.C. opened to uh, the public generally. Yes, that was their first succeed, first success. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody who came today and hope you all have a very wonderful summer. Our next luncheon is in September, and we hope to see everybody here and, and more people here. So thank you all very much.